And I'm basically doing this to try to save my own life. It's a very mm. selfish reason. How did you find the carnivore diet? Okay, well, I actually didn't start out uh, carnivore. I had started out with low carb intermittent fasting, or maybe I should go back a little bit and give you my whole background story. Um, last year, um, in July, I started having uh, chest pains um, when I was just doing a simple walk with my wife. And at that time, uh, my background is um, I don't smoke, I don't drink. Um, none of my people in my family ever had cardiac disease or heart disease or anything. And so it was a surprise well, after I ended up going to the cardiologist, seeing a number of uh, doing a number of tests, seeing a number of other doctors and a number of cardiologists that they suddenly diagnosed that I actually had arteriosclerosis and I had basically a blockage in my heart. So what happened was I went in, ended up after a battery of tests, got, went to the hospital, got two stents put into my heart. One of them was in my LAD, uh, which apparently is the Widowmaker artery, which apparently kills a lot of people. And it was apparently 95% blocked. The problem was because I never had any family history of this, and I never, I basically thought I was leading a fairly good lifestyle. The only thing I could think of was that I was a little bit overweight. I was like at 215, 220 at the time. And okay, so I'm six foot tall, so that puts me in the overweight, slightly obese. Uh, category. And um, so I was confused why I came down with heart disease and almost had a heart attack and almost died. What happened since then, it's, I saw a lot of cardiologists, probably like uh, 10, 10, 12 different cardiologists between the cardiologists that first diagnosed it, the one that did my stents, and then the one that uh, basically doing the rehab and a whole bunch in between. Each one, after my stent procedure, I asked them one question, which was, why me? Why me? Because I didn't think I was eating that unhealthy. Like, I mean, yes, I was overweight, but I wasn't pigging out on junk food. I wasn't like doing the fast food thing. I was like eating normally. I was eating at that time what I thought was a normal healthy diet. Like, yes, I did not eat as much vegetables. I wasn't vegan but or anything like that, but I was having vegetables, so, which I thought was good. And so I was started researching. Now, that was the weird part. When I started researching the causes of my condition, I could not find, um, I actually never heard of carnivore back then. I barely heard about keto, saw some things about keto, uh, saw some videos from Dr. Ken Berry about, but this was before he went full carnivore. And it was basically when he was doing low carb keto uh, bit, bit. And and I said, well, that was, I sort of sloughed it off. Okay, that's a way of losing weight or whatever. And um, I couldn't, never found anything. And what happened is in January, after doing a bunch of research still, I said, okay, never mind. I've asked all the doctors. I've asked everyone I could meet. Um, I said, no one seems to know. Um, I'm an engineer and an entrepreneur, so I've led teams of technical people. And this one thing that was striking with me was, was these are educated doctors, specialists, and I could look. I could tell by the look in their eyes when I asked them what was what caused it, and all they could answer was with a shrug and said genetics, which didn't sit well with me because I had no family history of the problem. So anyway, I said, fine, I'm going to take my own health into my own hands. I will lose weight. So I started intermittent fasting, did 18-6 intermittent fasting, um, did low carb and basically started losing weight. So that went on fine. And I was actually getting a little bit healthier. Um, but then finally I ran across um, 
the carnivore videos. And the clincher to me was seeing, um, seeing Dr. Anthony Chafee's uh, video where he was spousing that plants are out to kill you. Um, and it made sense to me. It basically made complete sense. It's like plants have no defense mechanism. So they create a biological defense mechanism by putting up basically insecticide that kills insects that want to eat them. And these chemicals also damage the human body. So it made perfect sense to me. So in May of this year, I basically went full carnivore. And I've been carnivore ever since with occasional hiccups, but pretty much carnivore. Uh, the one thing I did notice, though, was when the moment I went carnivore about two, three weeks in, I was suddenly had a lot more energy than when I was doing um, just low carb uh, keto. I'm still doing intermittent fasting, um, so I'm eating two meals a day, but the energy was very interesting. I'm like, it's, I actually have more energy now than I had when I was younger. And I could tell because I do a lot of home improvement projects, like uh, handyman stuff. Like I'd go fix something in the house. I'd go build something. And every time I would, and lately I've been doing, even before I started having these heart disease, when I was, when I would do something simple, like, I don't know, put up a picture frame or something like that, or put up a curtain, um, I would be tired. And my wife would tell you that, uh, yeah, like I can only do one thing at a time. So I would do one project, even if it's a small project, get it done. And then I would be resting the rest of the time, like for an hour or two at the afterwards. Now I'm basically building one thing after another around the house. Um, like I just finished putting up a server rack in, in my home lab and I'm like going, okay, now what else can I do? So, I mean, those servers were kind of heavy. So that was impressive in itself, but something I used to do when I was young and like, even when I was young though, I would still be tired after doing something like that. And now I'm like going, wow, I can keep going. So that has been very advantageous to me. i found that the side effect of being carnivore was uh, very good. So I'm probably going to keep going on this carnivore diet. It's helped out quite a bit. Um, I was surprised how much it was even compared to straight keto, low carb, because when I was doing keto, low carb, I was, I was still eating vegetables because I thought that that was good for me. So I was actually going to Egg Smart here in Toronto and having their keto breakfast every now and then, which is consists of uh, eggs, bacon, um, a whole lot of spinach, an avocado, almonds, and uh, strawberries and blueberries. When I thought that was healthy. <laughs> and yeah, it did help me lose weight, but I didn't realize that uh, plants were out to kill me. <laughs> so what really surprised me more is that why doesn't most people, more people know about this? Why did I think even a year ago that what I was eating was healthy? I don't understand that. I, I really don't. Um, I've since then read several books. I've read Nina, Nina Teichold's books and, um, and I've also read uh, Sally Norton, I believe, about toxic foods. I watched her videos and like, I'm like going, why was, isn't this more known? And I'm right now struggling still trying to get the word out. I'm actually failing getting the word out because uh, my older brother, who's 15 years older than me, actually has uh, rheumatoid arthritis and uh, diabetes. And I've been trying to convince him, you know, you really should try to this carnivore diet thing and stop eating vegetables. But he's refusing to listen to me. So I don't know what else. If I can't reach him, maybe I can reach somebody else. Maybe someone like me that was in the same situation that stumbles across this video or whatever. So hmm. that's been my motivation. So it, it's really, would you describe it as kind of an awakening? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's definitely yeah. an awakening. 
Um, s- it's actually like awakening from a, a nightmare almost because I don't be- I don't understand why everyone believes this. Why the doctors don't know this? Why the doctors have no clue how to treat someone with heart disease? Like based upon what I've been researching from Dr. Ken Berry and everybody else and Dr. Filippo Dedia, I'm like going, I know what caused my heart disease. It was basically, I had metabolic uh, disease. I had basically fatty liver or whatever. It spilled out into the rest of my body. And it's like, well, I losing weight is definitely going to help it, but going full carnivore is probably helping me quite a bit more. Yeah. So, um, how are people around you? Are, are you living on your own? Are you married? Do you have kids? I have. I'm uh, with my wife. Uh, we've been married for 35 years now. So, and we have uh, kids, two daughters, and a granddaughter. Um, um, my wife is. On, what my wife was on board with me completely with the low carb intermittent fasting because she's also overweight and she's also pre diabetic. Um, so we've been doing the intermittent fasting low carb bit since January. Um, her A1C actually went down from 7.1 to now it's uh, 6.1 which is uh, quite a lot better, although I hope to get it into the five stages soon. Now, she, however, doesn't buy into the whole carnivore thing. She thinks vegetables are good for you, and she keeps harping on me that I should be eating vegetables. And I'll say it quietly. Hopefully, she doesn't scream and yell at me saying this. But, yeah, she's also trying to get me to eat more fruits as well. But <laughs> Unfortunately, she's still of that mindset, and she refuses to watch Anthony's Chafee's video, even though I played a small sound, a small snippet of it to show her she still doesn't believe it. It's just so ingrained in our own upbringing, I guess. Like, I had a hard time. I'm like looking at the carnivore diet. I'm like, okay, uh, so fats is good for me. Butter is good for me. So I should be eating all the fat on my ribeye steak instead of trimming them off. And when I first started, that was a little bit of a challenge to do actually. It was like, okay, I'm eating something that's supposed to be bad for me. And this whole thing is basically shocking me. It's like, how could we have it so 180 reverse? How could we have what is good for us to be taught to us to be bad for us? And what is bad for us to be taught to be good for us? It just drives me nuts and it's like, That's actually why I decided to come on, try to speak with you, try to even start up my YouTube channel again and do some posts on on X Twitter to try to get the word out because I'm like going, this can't be right. Like, it can't be right that even the doctors are all brainwashed into the old way of thinking on what and have it reversed. It doesn't make sense. We're killing millions of people this way. So, uh, I mean... For the backwards, the, the backwards thinking about the diets, you know, like uh, for me, that's that feels just, you know, the uh, the indoctrination over a lifetime. That feels like it's 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 purely about money. But um, I'm interested on the doctor side. What what do you think it is that they're blind to this? I think it, that's just all they've been taught. That's what they've been taught. They've been taught by the pharmaceutical companies that said they've been taught that statins are good for you. They've been they've been basically fake um, faked out. Basically, they've the medical schools believed that the professors at the medical schools believed it, taught everybody all their students the same thing, and that seen and also the governments believe it. That's why they put the Health Canada guidelines are like that. The American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association guidelines all espouse the same thing. And it's just so pervasive. I just can't believe how pervasive it is. And I read the story and I saw the videos from Tim Noak on how he had to battle for his own uh, license just because he went against the grain. And 
that's crazy. That's the whole point of science, right? You're supposed to be able to go against the grain. Exactly. Like you're supposed to prove if it's true or not. And that's the other killer thing is that like when I was doing my research, I don't, I didn't just research YouTube, but whatever. I actually read papers uh, because of my engineering training. It wasn't that difficult for me to read medical um, papers as well. So I was reading these studies and as an engineer, I also have some statistics background. So I'm reading these papers and the crazy thing is, a lot of papers I've read, you read the conclusions, and then you go back, and I go, I always go back and go to the raw data. I skip the fluff and methodology, but I go back and raw, I read the conclusions, I read, go back and read the raw data. And I'm like looking, this data doesn't match the conclusions whatsoever. And I, it's not just one paper, it's like paper after paper, I see that the conclusions are fudged or the conclusions have exaggerated the data or the conclusions are outright 180 from the data. And the killer is that when I, when I first graduated from university, um, I took a job um, doing some networking. I was doing some network cabling at the University of Toronto. Um, it's a contract job to wire up Cat5 around some labs in Toronto in the University of Toronto. While I was wiring up the, uh, the uh, networking and, kept, and the, uh, in one of the labs, one of the labs was actually a nutrition lab. And I, was, I overheard the prof talking to his graduate students. And he was discussing, how can we throw out these outlier data so that the, so that the data will fit our hypothesis? At that time, I was already shocked. I'm like going, this doesn't make sense. It's like, you don't throw out data. But like, I was there, I heard him say, let's throw out some data to make it fit. That's all, uh, uh, that, that's crazy. So uh, it's almost like they've got an idea um, of where they want to go and it's just okay well we'll collect the data and then we're going to massage the data or modify the yes. language in such a way that we get to what we wanted to say in the first place yes exactly at, at first like I was young then for, fresh out of school and I thought okay maybe this prof is just the exception and I didn't say anything because I wasn't my business and I was just there to do the networking there and but now after researching more and more papers reading them on my own to research my condition metabolic condition my cardiac condition i'm like looking at that and i'm saying you know what what i saw like 30 years ago was 35 years ago was is still happening today and it's more prevalent than i even thought i i was shocked so now I look at all the papers with a very critical grain of salt and I'm like going, okay, what did the data actually say? Mm. Yeah. And yeah. How much of it did they have to throw out in order yes. to, uh, in order to reach this conclusion? Where, where do you think this is going then? Um, do you think this is just something that globally we'll always be fighting against? There's never going to be a resolution to this. Do you think it's going to get, harder and harder and harder to eat a proper human diet or do you think the proper human diet is going to win out at some point well i certainly hope it's not going to keep going like this i certainly hope that the proper human diet's going to win out um i want to help make that happen and and um like the way i look at it is there are i've always tried to say that I'm, I'm not, I, I'm more optimistic and I have more belief and faith in humanity that I believe that uh, what I, I try not to make sure, I try not to jump to conclusions. I try to think that, okay, maybe this guy's doing this for, uh, because he's just mistaken. He's not nefarious or evil or whatever, or just greedy. Um, I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt. My wife would say I'm too much of an optimist and I keep getting stomped on, but I like to believe that. Um, so I'm still 
somewhat hoping that people are just, yes, there are probably some bad actors there that actually know they're doing evil, but I'm hoping still the most of the people are still doing it for the right reasons, but have just been mistaken or misled or both. Um, I hope that will change. I especially hope that the doctors wake up and realize what they've been taught in medical school isn't reality and that they're willing to learn. Unfortunately, the problem is I also see a lot of doctors, and I saw that with a lot of my fellow engineers who graduated with me. After they graduated from university, they like going, okay, that's it. I know I don't have to learn anymore. I've learned everything I need to learn. I don't want to learn anymore. It's more like they don't want to learn. I always find it strange because I'm, I was always learning. I always wanted to keep learning something new. And yet when I approached my friends and I said, okay, this is interesting. And, and I remember uh, being shut down completely. I don't have time for this. I just want to go do my job, get my money and come, come home. I'm like going, but you're an engineer. You should be learning about the latest stuff. Isn't this interesting to you? Um, so I find that in the engineering profession, a lot of engineers are like that. In fact, the majority of my classmates were like that. So I would imagine in the medical professions, probably exactly the same. They basically stopped learning after they graduated and they're just practicing and doing what was taught to them, what was stagnated and taught to them at that time. Mm, kind of like I've put in my time. I don't want to, I just want to coast now kind of thing. Exactly. Mm. Wow. And I, I mean, I can imagine there's probably there's probably a lot of that and probably in combination with people who um, doctors, especially who are like, well, if I do things this way, I know kind of what my income's going to be yes. and uh, practicing this way. I don't know what the other options kind of hold. If I, if I change my approach to things. Yes, definitely. I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're definitely scared of rocking the boat. They're definitely scared of like standing out and mm. like possibly losing their license and losing their practice and losing their livelihood. Mm. So um you're in Canada. What's the yes. climate like there for someone who uh enjoys eating meat? Um <laughs> are you kind of do you find you're i guess under threat a little bit um yeah definitely i think so um like uh during my even during my my uh stent procedures and the hospitalizations i was in i was like looking at uh the food that the hospital food they were feeding me and i'm like going this is healthy <laughs> but um in canada in general though it's like i still i when I started going back to Exmart and having breakfast, and I said, I'm now can carnivore. I just want to uh, give me three eggs, four bacon, and four sausages. And the waitress would look at me funny and said, that's all you want? Here, I'll give you some fruits. No, I don't want fruits. I don't want fruits. Um, so just like on the carnivore side, it's hard to do because people have such a bad reaction to it. On the, on the other side where it's, the other thing is like, even if you're just trying to do low carb keto, what I'm finding as well is that they're pu pushing out so much of the vegetables and plant-based stuff that it's hard to do. Like I, I see everything now, everybody's saying, oh, you should eat whole grains, you should eat oatmeal. Like there's a lot of oatmeal pushes here right now in Canada. Um, and I'm like, I fell for it. Honestly, I fell for it. When I was doing low carb keto, I was d having a bowl of oatmeal. <laughs> like I didn't know it was bad for me. <laughs> it was like, okay. <laughs> I, I went and got the, the steel cut oats because that was supposed to be better for you. Then I started researching it some more and I said, it makes no difference whether it's steel cut or rolled, whatever. It's still going to be a high glycemic index, going to still shoot up my sugar. It's, and so maybe that was part of the reason I didn't feel as good when I was doing keto, but definitely felt a lot better when I'm doing uh, pure carnivore. It's also hard, though, because um, my ethnic background is Chinese, so I still eat a lot of Chinese food. We go to Chinese restaurants. It's really hard in the Chinese restaurants because um, rice is a lot 
is in a lot of dishes. Uh, they make a lot of dishes with rice flour. Um, there's noodles everywhere. And um, so it's a lot harder to eat uh, carnivore or even low carb in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> so where, when you do find yourself in that situation, how do you how do you handle it? Is it possible in a Chinese restaurant to say, just just give me the the meat only and no sauces, no no nothing, or do you just have to grin and bear it? I grin and bear the sauce part. Okay, the sauce part, I'll just try to reduce the amount of sauce I eat, uh, even though I know there's uh, cornstarch in the sauces, and there's some, some, there's definitely some sugar in the sauces. But uh, what I've been doing is uh, ordering basically dishes instead of uh, dishes with rice or dish or noodle dishes. So, for instance, like um, like just uh, two days ago, we went out to a Chinese restaurant. Um, I ordered, we ordered uh, alam alkan, uh, just ting alam alkan, which is just a plain uh, beef brisket and this beef tendon. And that was actually pretty good. And then we would order something like watanha, which is uh, eggs with uh, fried shrimp. So it's basically scrambled eggs, like a huge plate of scrambled eggs and uh, shrimp in it. And basically that was, uh, Pretty carnivore-ish enough for my taste. <laughs> like I've come to the realization there's no way I can 100% stay away from cornstarch flour and uh, sugars, although I try, especially when I'm at home, it's a lot easier just to put a ribeye on the barbecue. Uh, but when I go out, I'll still eat that, just trying, trying to minimize it. And it seems to work for me. Nice. So um, you mentioned you're doing two meals a day. Um, what do those two meals look like and what kind of what's the time frame you're eating in? I normally eat um, after uh, after 12 noon I would have my first meal. Um, I still do coffee with no sugar but with heavy cream. <laughs> Someday I'll try to stay and do a coffee removal withdrawal and see if that makes a difference at all but so far I like my coffee way too much. So I do coffee basically uh, as with my lunch, and I would basically have uh, bacon and eggs or sardines and eggs sometimes, um, leftover ribeye and eggs. Um, so lunch is pretty easy. Um, I get my liver in by having some pate every now and then. And then um, dinner, uh, I would eat normally we've, I've managed to convince my wife that we're now eating around 4.30ish. So then we start eating at 4.30ish and then uh, basically have whatever carnivore-ish type thing. My wife still wants some vegetables, <laughs> but sometimes I manage to get by, well, well, here's a huge ribeye. You're not going to be able to eat vegetables when you finish this, so eat the meat. <laughs> So I do that for her every now and then. Outside of like you're you're kind of cooking up dinner for her. Outside of that, is your wife is your wife kind of just cooking separately for herself? Like she'll get up and make no. breakfast for herself and that kind of thing. No, she's on uh, the intermittent fasting with me, so she eats oh, the same okay. eating window. Um, she has no problem with that. In fact, she says she's lost twenty pounds since we started. I've lost forty. Nice. So. <laughs> Um, but at least she's lost some weight and getting healthier. Um, she has, uh, like I said, she's willing to do that, but she says sometimes she has a craving for vegetables or fruits that she tries to sneak in. Mm. Um, but other than that, the eating window, the intermittent fasting window is fine. Um, she actually admitted because we've tried intermittent fasting before and my wife couldn't do it because she said, I get too hungry when I'm doing intermittent fasting because when, and yeah, that's, I agree with her because when I did intermittent fasting, um, like five years ago, trying to lose weight for my daughter's wedding, I could do it, but it was hard. I had to have willpower because I'd get hungry at night and I'm like going, no, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to go out and snack. I'm not going to get a glass of milk and just because I'm hungry. I basically had to bear through it. And so it did work. I did lose weight, 
I did lose like 20 pounds when I, when I did it before, but it was tough. And my wife said she can't handle it. She needs like, she, she gets too hungry and then snacks. Mm. But now, now that she's at least low carb, she's actually said, yeah, you know, I'm not hungry. So even going low carb with vegetable and that occasional fruit seems to be better than the standard American diet. Yeah, I guess, you know, even on low carb, you're increasing the amount of fats you're having. So you're going to increase your satiety, right? It's uh, Yeah. Yeah. What improvements that you've seen? What are the kind of the, the some total of improvements that would make you feel like there's just no way I'm going back? Well, the number one, like I mentioned before, was like the energy. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Like I could get a lot done now. I'm like doing a lot of things um, like just that uh, when I, and then like, even when I'm meeting people and things like that, I'm like going, okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, I finish a meeting and afterwards I'm not tired. I'm like, okay, let's go do, I'll go do something else. I'd go fix something up. I'd go uh, write some code somewhere or do something. Mm -hmm. I'm not the, the number one thing for me has been the energy. The number, the, the second thing basically for me, well, is weight loss. I've lost quite a bit of weight and I feel that's made me healthier. I like, I definitely was overweight in that. And I'm basically doing this to try to save my own life. It's a very mm. selfish reason. <laughs> um, but uh, I've noticed that the small, those are the big things that I've noticed with the carnivore diet. These but there's a lot of little things that I've noticed. Uh, my sleep is better. Um, my primary care physician actually sent me to a sleep to do a sleep study, and they diagnosed me with severe sleep apnea. This was before I had started the diet, and and now I'm like, and I know I had sleep apnea because I would wake up every now and then with headaches. My number one tell was when I wake up in the morning and I have a headache, I know I couldn't breathe the night before. Um, that is the, well, that would probably be the number, the third thing that I find improved quite a bit is that I no longer have headaches when I wake up in the morning. I'm like, I'm like perfectly fine. And the problem was before I researched all this, I thought that was normal. Like I met a lot of people who are popping Advil, like four or five Advils a day because they have headaches. And I thought, okay, I'm just getting old. That's why I'm getting headaches. And maybe I should, and some people, I just bear it, but some people pop pills. And that's a shocking thing. It's like, no, this is not because I'm getting old. This is because I have a condition. I have a disease because of my diet. And it's, it's like that is shocking to me because I'm like thought even even my lack of energy, I thought it was because I'm just getting old too. Like I didn't notice I was slowing down. I was having a harder time lifting heavier and heavier things, moving furniture and things like that. And I'm like going, that's my previous thought is all wrong. I'm like, I can do this again. I can do more now than even when I was 16 years old. I'm I'm really surprised like how much it has changed the energy and the ability to do things. If you've got a, if you've got a friend who's uh, not doing well, health wise, weight wise, whatever, they're just saying, I can't sleep or whatever it is. Um, what's your elevator pitch to them to, uh, <laughs> to give carnivore a try? <sighs> I wish I had the canned elevator pitch that I knew would work because I've been trying it with a number of people. Um, the only thing I can say right now is try to plant some seeds, some like try to send some information their way. But the problem, here's the fundamental problem though, Dave. It's like, I come out sounding like a fanatical zealot. I come out <laughs> like, sounding like a cult member. It's just because I'm so... I found this is just so amazing, but to them, I think I'm sounding like a cult member trying to pitch them into my cult. 
So I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't know how to actually do this. So I'll, I'm watching all your channel and several other channels, hoping someone would give some success story on how to help other people um, decide to take the plunge. But yeah, I really don't know what the actual answer is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't have good answers um, to, to it either. I just feel like um, it, it's, it's so difficult because you can rave on about it all as much as you want. But one of the biggest issues is no one is going to take it seriously yeah. um, until they've actually tried it, until they've passed that point where they suddenly go, I'm feeling amazing. And I've, I don't remember ever feeling this way. And that might happen 30 days in. It might not happen until right. 90 days in. <laughs> And so you've got to have that the person who's trying it has got to have the willpower to to get to that say ninety day mark or that hundred and twenty day mark, you know. And if they're and there's a lot of obstacles in the way, right? Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Like, like one of the tr things that tripped me up too was. Um, I did not know about uh, electrolytes, and I actually found I needed to um, take some electrolytes um, every now and then. I'm like mm. um, taking one pack of Element every every day or every other day. I find I, I at least need that much. It seems right. to be the the lack of magnesium or something to that effect, because I'm pretty sure I have enough sodium and potassium in my diet, but it might be the magnesium. And the and just taking the the element that gives you and that gives you enough. You're not getting muscle cramps or anything like that. Yeah, it definitely yeah. helps with all that. Mm. Oh, the other thing I would I wanted to point out is that a lot of people starting carnivore. And it happened to me was that um, I thought I had constipation because I'm used to going doing a dump taking a dump every day, like. And I had I have bouts where I have really hard constipation before, so it's like it scares me when I don't take a dump every day because I know the next day it's going to be a lot harder. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize when I went full carnivore, and I didn't. This didn't happen when I was on low carb keto. I was still taking a dump every day when I was low carb keto, but when I went carnivore, I'm like taking a dump every two, every third day, maybe even now and then. And it's like, okay, when I accepted the fact that, okay, that's normal. I'm not going to have, I have, I've always had problems with hemorrhoids since I was a kid. I'm not going to have like bloody stools because my hemorrhoids coming out. Um, it was a lot easier. Like there's, just, there's little nuances of these tiny things. I think we need to make people aware of when they go mm. down the carnivore route. Yeah. Um, because everyone's natural inclination is I'm constipated. I haven't been. Yeah. And it's like, well, do you actually feel constipated? <laughs> because, you know, your body's just using more of the food that you're eating. It doesn't have to be produced as waste, right? So um, your your hemorrhoid situation has improved on having been on carnivore? It's improved. Uh, it hasn't gone away completely. I would say it's improved. Like, I... Well, part of the reason I'm having uh, bleeding from my hemorrhoids as well is because of my heart condition, because of my stents, I'm basically on blood thinners as well. So oh. I bruise very easily. I bleed very easily. Any wounds I have take a while to heal. Um, mm. So that's what's causing the occasional bleed. But it's it's actually a lot better than what I had before, so, even yeah. before I had the heart condition. It's kind of all for you for for life then, Paul? Uh, pretty much. I will take carnivore vacations because it's hard to do it like when you're on a cruise ship or something like that. It will still be low carb, but it will not be completely carnivore um, because the food mm. is just too yummy. So, But uh, pretty much the day-to-day -day diet will be carnivore for me. Uh, hopefully my wife can follow on, but she just thinks eating... She's, 
her comment to me the other day was eating ribeye was too boring. I want to eat something else other than a ribeye steak every day. Um, for me, I'm perfectly fine with, with that, but she wants variety. Yeah. I, I feel that's one of those other things that once you get past a certain point doing carnivore, be it, you know, 60, 90, 120 days, that then you suddenly, in my experience anyway, you suddenly go, oh, it's not boring anymore. I'm actually looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah. But again, you've got to get to that point to notice, you know. Yeah. Oh, nice. So um, if people want to reach out to you, how can they get in touch, Paul? Um, I'm mainly active on uh, X slash Twitter at Paul C. Tan on X with Twitter. I have a YouTube channel, which I haven't used in like eight years, I think, at Paul C. Tan as well. Um, I might revive that and put some videos on there. Thank you so much for spending time with us. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Like I said, you were one of the YouTubers that helped convince me to go carnivore. <laughs>